Hey everybody, I'd like to spend a few minutes today talking about something that my mom and I watched when I wasn't feeling well, and that was Little Dorrit, the 2008 BBC miniseries adaptation of the novel by Charles Dickens, which stars Claire Foy and Matthew McFadden. This is one of those rare times when I am reviewing an adaptation without having read the book first. <gasps> I've been intending to read it for a long time now, pretty much ever since I watched the adaptation when it aired on PBS ten years ago. I just haven't gotten around to it. I mean, I don't know why. I love Dickens, I know I'll enjoy the story, and I do have a copy, although it is a dusty, old, fragile family heirloom, so I'm not sure I want to drag it around. The title is actually spelled wrong on this binding, see? Dorrit with two T's. Still, when faced with the choice between reading Little Dorrit and reading something else, I have continually opted for something else. Because of that, there have also been about 10 years of my mom saying, I'd like to watch Little Dorrit again, and me saying, no, I want to read the book first, which drives her crazy, by the way. But finally, a week and a half ago, I admitted that I was getting tired of waiting for me too, and plus I was sick, and when I'm sick, I often get a hankering for a nice juicy period drama to get lost in, so I said, hang it all, let's just watch it. Little Dorrit is about a lot of things, bureaucratic incompetence, financial corruption, social hierarchy, but it focuses on the patriarch of the Dorrit family and his youngest daughter, Amy, who was born and raised in the Marshalsea debtors prison. Though her father is an inmate, Amy is able to leave the prison during the day, which she does in order to earn money to support him. At her new employment, she comes across Arthur Clennam, who takes an interest in her family and believes that his father's business might have wronged the Dorrits in the past. He sets out to investigate his theory and rectify the situation, if at all possible, not knowing that his actions will set a series of events in motion that will overturn everything Amy has ever known. This is Dickens, and as it always is with Dickens, the story has a plethora of personalities and caricatures, a lot of them with peculiar attributes and deliciously bizarre names. There are characters to adore, characters to despise, characters to pity even though you don't really like them. To bring such vivid characters to life, you need a talented, vibrant cast, and Little Dorrit really delivers. Watching it again, it seemed like almost every character was played by someone I recognized, and I spent a ridiculous amount of time trying to figure out what I knew all these actors from, which was silly because, for all I know, I knew them from when I saw it the first time. Playing the hey what was he in game while also trying to keep track of the various subplots and figure out how all these characters are related to each other was kind of mentally exhausting, but it was awfully fun. It's interesting to see some actors here who have become much more famous over the last decade, including Claire Foy, who stars as Amy Dorrit, and Andy Serkis, who plays the rascally and eccentric murderer Rigaud. You get to see a lot more of Andy Serkis's face here than you usually do, and oh my goodness, does he ham it up with an exaggerated French accent and weird flamboyant mannerisms. He is just completely over the top in this part. Tom Courtney is particularly good as William Dorrit, who has grown so accustomed to being the father of the Marshalsea and treated with a certain kind of deference that he's lost the ability to function as a gentleman in the outside world. He's comically absurd at times, yet he also does some disturbing things, especially in his unfair treatment of his youngest daughter, who is without question the sweetest and most giving of his three children. He's a very complex, contradictory character, and I found my feelings toward him constantly changing. I think Matthew McFadden also does a particularly fine job as Arthur Clennam, who is refreshingly natural in his interactions with every character he comes in contact with, which is a lot of people. I think he does the most circulating among the various subplots. He's a good-tempered hero who makes some unfortunate mistakes, but always has the best of intentions, and he ends up in some hilariously awkward and bizarre situations to which McFadden gives the best reactions. 
Much as I enjoy Dickens' main characters, though, it's often his supporting characters who I love the most. Some of my favorites in this one include Maggie, Frederick Dorrit, Mr. Panks, Edmund Spangler, Mrs. Plornish, and Cavaletto the Italian. Delightful characters, all of them. And in every Dickens story, it seems there's at least one lovelorn character who I take a special liking to, someone who falls hopelessly in love, and that love, though unreturned, ends up being the making of him. I'm adding John Chivery to that list of special characters. He's kind of bumbly, and I don't know why he goes through the pain of proposing when it's so obvious he's in the friend zone, but he has a couple of the most tender, emotional scenes in the whole thing. His speech to Arthur Clennam in one of the last episodes is just, ugh, so moving. This entire production is very appealing. The music is pretty, the scenery looks fantastic, the costuming is interesting, I'm curious why they have Amy almost always wearing shades of purple. Even a character's makeup, or lack of it, draws your attention, especially in Fanny Dorrit's case. I love the stuff with the circumlocution office, which I think is a department that Dickens must have invented, right? There couldn't possibly be a real federal agency with such an absurd name. It's a very apt title for what it is, though, and the scenes there are brilliantly filmed. There are some stylistic choices that I don't care for so much, some storytelling devices that feel a little dated or heavy-handed. There are also some things that I seriously doubt were part of the book. This screenplay was written by Andrew Davies, after all, who is great at turning classic literature into fresh and enticing entertainment, but, well, he doesn't put the source material on a pedestal. He's not afraid to add and subtract and embellish wherever he thinks it would be an improvement. That artistic license sometimes works for me, sometimes it doesn't. And the biggest thing that I had trouble with in this adaptation, and my mom did as well, was that in the last two episodes, there are a lot of revelations and twists, and it gets awfully confusing. Some of these revelations are unclear or hard to follow, depending on who's doing the revealing. Sometimes the explanations are too rushed. We learn mind-blowing new information, but don't get time to process it before the next thing is happening. Couple all that with the fact that the resolution itself is definitely on the sensational side with a generous sprinkling of Dickensian coincidences, and it's just a lot to take in. Unfortunately, at this point, I can't tell you how the miniseries compares to the book, but hopefully, someday soon, I will have an opinion on that. I do feel much more motivated to read it now that I've been reintroduced to the story, and I really enjoyed watching it. I'm especially looking forward to reading Dickens' original take on his characters, as well as his commentary on life in the Marshall C. Debtors' Prison, as he did draw from his own harrowing experience there. I would recommend Little Dorrit if you haven't seen it before and you don't mind watching a seven-hour period drama. It is a very entertaining, lavish production filled with great performances. I don't love it as much as I love Bleak House. That one's cemented as one of my favorite period dramas ever, I think. And Little Dorrit doesn't quite measure up to that level, but it is very good. I hope you enjoyed this review. Let me know your thoughts on this adaptation if you've seen it, and I'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching!